good. Okay. Thank you for reading my mind. That was it. Okay. Good evening. My name is Sherry Williams, and I'll be your moderator for this class. Welcome to another lecture given by the Tampa class. This is a school and not a church, and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. The Tampa branch was established in the year 1996. At this time, I would like to introduce to you the Dean of this branch, Dr. Joel Turner and our president, Dr. Cynthia Smith. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of our Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title of the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The apostle Paul filled with the Holy Spirit tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means that Elohim is the title our creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any letters or characters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by the letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah. Therefore, making such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible renderings of the true and original name of our Father and his Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit. And in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape or form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape okay. and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form could only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Joshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should all ask ourselves is, what was the name of the savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface to the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called a divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. 
After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. This pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Also in this school, we have 10 primary constitutional aims or objectives and they are as follows. First is to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And 10th is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of a mortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is speak the truth. <clears throat> We'll have class dedicated in prayer this evening by Dr. Jennifer Marshall, followed by our scripture reading, which is Psalms, the 19th division, which will be read by Dr. Latara Burley. Um, and our scripture readers this evening are Drs. Latara Burley and Dr. Pamela Turner. Let's all bow our hearts and minds to Yahweh and thank Yahshua for bringing us to another class. We pray that you help us all to love each other and be grateful for all the things that he has shown us about himself and that he is real and that he has chose us to know that truth. Help us to continue in strength. Let us all say hallelujah. 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 Uh, there's no music selection, is it? No. Okay. Just want to make sure. Okay. Um, I will be reading out of the King James Version and inserting the proper names. Psalms, the 19th chapter. The heavens declare the glory of El, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter his speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is going out through, through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heavens and his circuit until the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. 
The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. The statues of Yahweh are righteous, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahweh is clean, endureth forever. The judgments of Yahweh are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there that is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret fault. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Yahweh, my strength and my redeemer. That was Psalms, the 19th division. Good evening, brethren. Our first speaker this evening will be Dr. Connor Merzley. Good evening, my fellow brethren, or well, in this case, it would be good night for me because it's already dark outside. Well, I guess the first thing I'll do is lay down a little bit of foundation and then we'll see how much Yahshua brings out. Um, so the first thing is I want to say I love you all and I know it's been a while, but so this this school that we go to, it was founded in the year of 19, 1931. There was a man by the name of Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley. And in 1931, after he was kicked out of the Church of God, he, he wandered in his mind for two years about how Yahweh Elohim would judge the world and make everyone see eye to eye. So after, after some time and thinking about it, uh, there was a death of his son. And he wondered why he couldn't heal his son, but yet he could heal everyone else around him. So he questioned in his mind if Yahweh wanted him to be a minister or not. And this is when his... This is when it all changed because Yahweh gave this man, he pulled him up out of his, his physical body and into the third heaven, which is eternity. And he showed him the entire purpose of Yahweh from start to finish. If you could get the ages and dispensation chart for me, please. Um, I'll cover that just a little bit and then we'll go on to the chart because that's one thing Yahweh's really been showing me lately. There's no, there's no stopping to the learning of Yahweh. Every time you look at something, there's always going to be another principle that he shows you that you didn't see before, even though you looked at it maybe a hundred times. And um, so on this chart, it says creation abides within Yahweh or eternity, the cloud symbolizing eternity. So, in this chart, we have the, the seven ages, as well as the seven dispensations and all the things that happen between them. You know, like Noah and the flood, uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, the death, burial, resurrection of Yahshua and Messiah, Moses and the children of Israel, Pentecost, uh, the conversion of the Gentiles seven years later. See, Dr. Kinley saw all these things. He saw... The whole purpose from beginning to ending. So, and it was actually interesting too, because it took him almost two years. I say him, but it was really Yahshua the Messiah in him doing all the preaching and the teaching, you know, all that, because no one else knew but him. Just like when Yahshua the Messiah came in, you know, in the year right there where you see it on the chart in the middle. When he came in, no one knew about the purpose but him. 
And just like when Moses was on Mount Sinai, no one knew the purpose of him. Uh, no one knew the purpose other than them at these particular moments. So it's amazing how it works because it just shows that that's Yahshua sending, that's Yahweh sending in his son, Yahshua, in order to teach his people his will. Because part of Yahweh's purpose is to have offspring, you know, and we, we could see a Romans 119 and 20 about that. All of us, some, not everyone on this planet, wants to have a child. Some don't. But it goes forth to show that this is what Yahweh wanted. He wanted to make angels. He wanted to make creatures that would, you know, respect him and serve him and glorify him honor him and obey him that's what he created us for and um it's funny because they talk about it in this world they always talk about how uh you know what's your purpose what are you here to do and you know so many times i just want to say look i'm here to study and learn about yashua and that's it but when i have said that to some people they look at me like okay this guy's a little crazy but that's okay they thought Noah was crazy, too. And they thought Dr. Kinley was crazy, too, just like they think the rest of us are crazy. But that's only because we get to know the truth, right? We've been invited to a special gathering, or I'll say it this way. We've been invited into a, a heavenly kingdom that is strictly for the sons and the sons only. Nobody else gets to go because all of us, I'm speaking collectively, even the sons that are going to come, because I don't know how long this creation will be here. We're all one son. Does that make sense? We're not, we're not the head of the body. He's still the head. He governs all of us. But collectively, we're all one son. We're all Yahshua. Not in the fullness, I'll say it that way, as he was. But we're still that one son. You know, um, can you get me that scripture? That scripture where it talks about, uh, I have called my one, I have called my son out of Egypt. The one where it talks about Yahshua. Hosea 11.1. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> I don't know who the scripture, who the scripture is there. Hosea, I got it. Hosea 11 and start of one. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. All right. So see, no, that's good. Yahweh called Israel. If you could go to the Moses chart for me, please, really quickly. So the physical manifestation of what we could see on the Moses chart or on the elementary chart because it has it on that too but if you see on the Moses chart it has Egypt at the bottom and it has the wilderness of Sinai and it has the children of Egypt not children of Egypt wow children of Israel who were the children of Yahweh as well as Moses and Joshua and Caleb Eleazar I think it's Phineas, I'm not sure. But these people were all, you know, in Egypt at some point. Moses wasn't there. He was born there, but, well, well we can't go into that right now. Mo Moses and the children of Israel were pulled out of Egypt. So basically, I need someone to get Exodus 3.16. Uh, where it talks about the burning bush and Moses getting the name of Yahweh. Because that's where all of this starts. I can say it that way, according to the purpose. Okay, I have it. Um, Exodus 3 and 16. 13. Or 3 and 13. Oh, sorry. Here we go. And Moses said unto Elohim behold when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them the Elohim of your fathers has sent me unto you and they shall say to me what is his name what shall I say unto them 
And Elohim said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt, shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And Elohim said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Yahweh Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Thank you. So I'll save it for another vessel to go into, but um, the part where it said, I am that I am, Yahweh is, I will be what I will to be. It's I or Asher, I or, um, no, I or Asher, I or. And uh, this is just a description of Yahweh, you know, to show how he is in his original state. And I could say it that way. But at this burning bush, when Moses receives the name of Yahweh, he's talking to Yahweh Elohim, or he's having a vision. He's having a vision of Yahweh Elohim, and Yahweh Elohim is telling him what to do. So he gives him his name. He gives him two people, Aaron, which was the spokesman of Moses, who was a stutter. So he's a type of the law, and Aaron is a type of the prophets. So he goes down with the name. Law and the Prophets, or Types and Shadows of the Law and the Prophets. And he goes down with some miracle signs. Um, you know, like the leprous, when he put his hand in his bosom. So that was a principle of, of death and life. Yahweh showing that he has power over everything. Um, there was another sign where he told him to take some water and pour it on the land and turn it into blood. And... There was the one where he told him to um, cast his, his rod on the ground and then turn into a serpent, which is the most deadliest snake, by the way. A serpent is top, top deadly, top venomous. But all these signs show principles of Yahweh having power over life and death. So then Yahweh sent them down. Moses and Aaron into the land of Egypt where they encountered the children of Israel who had been there for 400 years in bondage. So they were 400 years in psychological and physical darkness. And um, I say that because they didn't have the Holy Spirit at that time. So they were in darkness for 400 years psychologically physically from the Egyptians and all the burdens they had on them. And so what Yahweh did, and I need someone to get this for me, Yahweh said, I am come down to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. And while you're looking for that. Exodus 3.8. All right. Exodus 3.8. Okay. Exodus 3 and 8. I am come down to deliver them out of the hands of, e of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, and unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites and the Jebusites. All right, thank you. So see, Yahweh came, Yahweh came down. This is this is a type and shadow of Yahweh's purpose that is revealed to us now, right? So these children of Israel were in darkness and Yahweh came down to deliver them out of their own, well, obviously back then it was physical Egypt, but Yahweh came down now and took on shape and took on form within you, within your own psychological Egypt and pulled you out. And, uh, uh, you know, obviously he came to us physically. Some of us, he came to us in visions and revelations. Some of us, he came physically. But the point is, it was still Yahweh that came to all his creatures because that's how Yahweh Elohim, or as we say, Yahshua, communicates with his creatures. Is through vision and revelation because he is not 
He's not a physical being like we are. Even though we are spiritual beings, don't get me wrong, we are. We still have physical bodies. Yahshua isn't like that. He is. Hmm. Yahshua is the creator. So he can, he can speak both in a physical body and appear in a person's mind and speak to him. He has power to do that. And we could also call it another thing that is commonly called astral projection, right? Because when Moses and Aaron were going to meet each other, they didn't know where each other were. Moses didn't know where Aaron was. Aaron didn't know where Moses was. But Yahweh talked to both of them at the same time. And there's a great example of that in the Bible where he appeared unto 500 brethren at once. That's a lot of people seeing one one being at one time. That's impressive. But so what these what this points to is that this is how this is how we know Yahweh is real because we've seen him, we've heard him. And we can prove him according to the law and the prophets. But Going back to the pattern of the tabernacle, Yahweh made me say all that for a reason. But going back to the wilderness of Sinai, they had to, Moses was called up into the mount and he was given a vision. There's another vision. He was given a panoramic vision of Yahweh Elohim. And from the beginning of the creation, so if you could pull up the 40 play chart, it's I think it's eschatology or cos it's cosmogony. So from cosmogony to Pentecost is what Moses saw, right? And then John he saw from the end of the creation of Yahweh all the way straight to the beginning, and then Dr. Kelly saw all of it. So I didn't learn anything by myself. I know I didn't. It had to be revealed to me, every little bit of it, because, you know, I know I'm not a smart individual, if I can put it that way. Um, but that's to show all of us that the, these are some of the things that are happening to us in this school. We're being changed, you know, like a butterfly. It it eats and it goes according to the tabernacle pattern too. It eats. Um, could you pull up the green chart for me, please? This is this is just where Yahweh is leading me. It's so beautiful. But uh, on the green chart, if you see right there, there's an image of a butterfly. He starts out in an egg, right? So that would be like a dead state. Uh, when you when you take a plant and you put it in the ground, it's dead. It's uh, it's not moving. There's nothing nothing special about it. It doesn't. It's dead. You know. And so the same thing with this butterfly, it's dead in that state and then it breaks out and becomes uh, a larvae, which is like a little itty bitty baby, right? So this is like, uh, if you want to compare it, it could be to like an embryo and a human. I'm saying human for contrast, but so it's like a little itty bitty baby and then it, it eats. And it eats and it eats and it eats, it eats milkweed, right? So as it eats, it grows and it, it gets bigger and it gets bigger. And once it's done eating, what, or I'll say it this way, once it reached its peak capacity for food, um, then it transformed into... I'm going to say it this way for the sake of context. It was rearranged inside out. So there's something on the inside of a butterfly called a marginal disc. And these are a, the blueprint for the butterfly form, right? But it has to go through a change first. So seeing all that, and then, you know, when, when it comes out, when it's ready, or I'll say it that way, when it's ready to come out of its cocoon, um, the cocoon has a golden crown around it. 
and it becomes clear, exposing the butterfly. And then when it comes out, it dries its wings, you know, with the heat from the sun, and then it flies. It's now free, um, you know, for the next five years of its life. But the principles of it is, you know, death, burial, resurrection, then ascension. We see how Yahshua went through that. Yahshua went through a death, a burial, a resurrection, and ascension. That's what the children of Israel went through. They went through a death, a burial, a resurrection, and an ascension. Uh, the seasons of the year, they go through that too. You know, right now we're in winter. It is cold. It is icy everywhere. It chills you when you go outside. It's like a type of death. You know, the trees are naked. Bugs and animals are hiding. Uh, you know, flowers and grass, everything, it's brown. And um, I've actually seen one flower one time when I was outside. In the middle of a winter, this flower, the way Yahweh formed the pattern on this flower, it looked like a sad face, right? So, but this is the stage that we have to go through. It has to be a death, burial. You know, there's the burial, which is fall, which is the death. And there's burial, which is winter. And then there's a spring, which is the resurrection. And then there's the summer, which is ascension, which would be like glorification. And we have that according to ages and dispensations too. And Adam all die. If you can go over to the ages and dispensations chart, please. Uh, but in Adam, all die. So that's the principle of blood, right? And so the beginning of this age opened with the death because Adam and Eve partook of the fruit, which was an olive of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So that was a death or a principle of blood. Then they started doing sacrifices. So there's your principle of blood continuing. And then that ended with, uh, with Noah and the flood. You know, that's a death too. It, uh, the, the people of Noah's time were warned for 120 years of uh, the antediluvian age. 120 years to hear the gospel. They didn't listen. And then they couldn't. They didn't have Joshua in them. They couldn't listen. So they all died. Well, you know, I'm not saying that they're lost. I know Yahshua went back up to these people, you know, and, and preached unto the spirits in prison. I need someone to get that for me. It's um because when Yahshua died. First Peter 3, 19 through 21. All right. Okay. 19 through 21 by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison which sometimes were disobedient when once the long suffering of Yahweh waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few that is eight souls were saved by water Thank the you. like figure unto even baptism doeth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answering of a good conscience towards Yahweh by the resurrection of the Messiah. All right. Thank you. So see, it is so beautiful because, you know, in Yahweh's purpose, the end is declared from the beginning, right? That's how it's always been. And it's so beautiful because if you compare it to today, it is the same situation principally. Yahweh is preaching to the spirits in prison. You know, he's, he's pulling all his sons out of spiritual and psychological prison. Or, or as we say sometimes, spiritual Babylon. Or um, in the book, I know it refers to it as spiritual Sodom and Gomorrah or spiritual Egypt you know I've I know I've called it that too sometimes <laughs> because it is if you look around you there's 
the Egyptian culture is still alive. It still exists. If you take a, a dollar bill, it has a pyramid on the back and it has the all seeing eye, which is, you know, one of their religions, if I could say it that way, of Egypt back then. So to all the sons out there who are hearing this, this is the time to start coming to class more, study more, listen to music more, do whatever you can to keep your mind focused on Yahweh because it's almost over. Um, as you can see, if you look at the ages and the dispensation chart, we're in the fourth age. Well, technically, we're, yes, we're in the fourth age, but we're also in a probationary period. And this probationary period is almost over. We've been teaching this thing for 90 something years now. And um, you know, it's getting worse out there. I'm currently going through a snowstorm, And I just had one like a week ago. You know, there's earthquakes happening everywhere. Uh, they're getting worse. Volcanoes are erupting. People are losing their minds. and killing other people you know i i could give you a whole list of a bunch of terrible things that are going on in this world right now but i don't want to do that because that's not what we're here to talk about we're here to talk about yashua because he is our salvation um if you look it up go online and do your own research shua in hebrew means salvation and Yah is the masculine portion of Yahweh's name. So it's saying Yah is salvation. Or Yahweh, your creator, is your salvation from spiritual death. Or I'll say it this way to make it more clear. An eternal life of spiritual torment in the unpleasant lake of fire part of Yahweh. Because Yahweh's both. Because Yahweh is all in all, the kingdom is in Yahweh, but also the lake of fire is in Yahweh. Right? We're in a, we're in these places literally right now as we're sitting here on the Zoom call. It's so beautiful. Give me that scripture where it talks about Yahweh is a consuming fire, or Yahweh our Elohim is a consuming fire. Um Please. <laughs> I'm looking it up. Uh, that's Hebrews. No Pam, you have it? Hebrews 12. Yeah. Uh, 29. Okay, sorry. I can get it. So good. Hey, I'm in no rush. I know. I know it takes time to do things. That's all good. Hebrews, Hebrews 12 and 29. I'll pick it up at 28. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve Yahweh acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our Elohim is a consuming fire. Thank you. So see, Yahweh our Elohim is a consuming fire. I looked it up once. The hottest type of fire in the world okay, is 1,500 degrees Celsius, and it's called white fire. You could look it up, right? Yahweh is hotter than that. Yahweh is, look, at the universal revelation of Yahshua the Messiah, everybody's going to see Yahweh Elohim, who is Yahshua. doesn't matter if you like him or not. Doesn't matter if you want to believe or not. It, it doesn't matter. One, once it's time, I'll say it that way for understanding. And he universally appears to everyone. That is it. It is over and we get to go. But that hasn't happened yet. So until then, Yahshua has to keep preaching through us until that last son is drawn out of psychological. But when yeah. that does happen, Go ahead. Yeah. When that does happen, the entire physical universe as we know it is going to 
I'm going to say it in a couple words. Dissolve, dematerialize, or be consumed. Okay. You could also call it the consummation, right? And from, from a spiritual perspective, because I know it doesn't necessarily work. When, when someone eats their food, right? It is consumed almost entirely. You know, there's still waste that is made from it. But that's because it's physical. But when Yahweh consumes, it burns everything. And we're, we're talking about universal destruction, if I could say it that way. Now, that might have been more clear to some people on YouTube than others. Universal salvation for the children of Yahweh who are present and alive today, as well as those who are waiting for the universal revelation. But it is universal destruction to those who are not the sons of Yahweh. It, it is horrible. I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It is horrible. It is a great and terrible day. And that's why it says that, because it's a great day for his sons, but it's a terrible day for Satan and his host. Well, you know, he can't live. He can't live forever. He's on borrowed time, just like the rest of us. You know, he's he's been here almost 6,000 years. It's time for him to go. It's time for him to be eternally destroyed, right? But... If you don't know about Yahshua, that's okay, because there's still time for anyone, doesn't matter who it is, to still come into the teaching. Yahweh's still sitting on his mercy seat. And I know that because I'm still here and I still exist in a physical body, no matter how much I don't want to. <laughs> I'm still here. I still exist in it. You know, Yahshua still shows me things, still corrects me. Every day he's... I see him bringing in more and more children into the teaching. Like, um, you know, one of my friends, he brought into the teaching not too long ago. I had two classes already and learned so much. Like it's, so see, there's hope. And I know this isn't something that's talked about much in the world, but it's talked about a lot in this class and others like it. There's a hope for eternal life. And look, I know, I know we've all been lied to about it for 4,000 years. 6,000, almost 6,000. I don't know how many years. I know it's been a very long time. Because Satan has been around the whole time. And he's been lying to all of us for pretty much our entire existence that we've been here. So... You know, I encourage everybody, even if you don't want to, because I know there's a lot of people out there who are going to hear this one time and say, oh, I don't want to do it anymore. Or they don't want to do any research. Or they don't want to check things out. Or they don't want to come back to class. Look, at least come back and check it out a little bit more. You know, I understand if it's Yahweh's purpose and they can't. Look, I'm not the one who de determines who comes to class and who joins the body and who doesn't. That's all to Yahshua. But the point is this. Once you come here, it is permanently ingrained in your mind. You'll never forget it. Right? So if you come here and you leave, that is on you. That blood is on your head. Because if you go back and look at the days of Noah, when he preached for 120 years, the blood was off his head and on to the people's heads. So that means everyone who's hearing my voice, this is now on you. And I don't mean that to say this selfishly. Trust me, I love you all. And there are some brethren out there who I don't even know that I love you. Because, because I, I can see the spirit working in me. You know, that's that's the goal of this, to see Yahshua in you and be, be a son, basically. 
I need someone to get that for me. It says where uh, to those who believe he gave power to become the sons of Yahweh. I don't know where that one is. But... John 1, 12. Okay. John 1, 12. John 1, 12. Okay. I'm almost there. John 1 and 12. But as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of Yahweh, even to them that believe on his name. There you go. So see, if you believe and you do your research and you do your homework, we say, and you come to class, listen to music if you have to. But you you will gain something greater than anything you've ever had before. I need someone to read the, the tenth aim for me, if you could, please. The ten, tenth aim of this institute. Yep, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Great. So see, that's the goal right now is to inherit eternal life in the kingdom of Yahshua with the hope of immortal glorification, right? So inheriting eternal life that's getting Yahshua's spirit in you. But you can't do that by yourself. He has to do it for you. And you have to let him do it. You can't fight and expect Yahweh to, you know, give you leeway. He doesn't like that. He doesn't. He, he had to deal with it enough, if I could say it that way. He dealt with it the whole time with the children of Israel because they were a type and example in order to teach us, you know. So Yahweh, um, there's another scripture I need. At that time, Yahweh winked at their ignorance. X 17, he, 30, and 31. All right. Acts 17 and 30. In the times of this ignorance, Yahweh winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. See, that says all men everywhere. Okay. I do know this, that only the sons of Yahweh are the ones who are going to believe. I already know that, and that is great. Because that means Satan or one of his demons won't be up there in heaven. But could you read that again one more time for me? Oh, never mind. Sorry. Thank you, though. Sorry. I, I get excited when Yahshua does that. No, you're fine. <laughs> so he called all men everywhere to repent because in the post diluvian age with the children of Israel and Moses and Yahshua, the son of Nun, or Oshia, the son of Nun, who was also called Joshua, he winked at it. He winked at all their, you know, mistakes and misforgivings and trespasses and all those things. And he does it now, too. He does wink now, too, if you know it. And then he gives you correction. Then you're responsible. It's on you now. And I hope, I hope everyone that hears me is getting this. Because it's so important that... How do I say it? This, this, to all the new people, because I don't know who's new, the more you participate in classes, study, research, the more it becomes alive, and the more you realize your life is like one of the people in the Bible, and then you become more connected with Yahweh, your creator. And then, you know, you get to love the brethren and be a part of this wonderful family that many of us don't have physically. And I can speak for myself. But there's only one thing that's really holding us all together, and that's Yahshua. Yahshua is our bond. He is our glue, as some say. He is he's a universal spirit that holds everything together. 
you know, like he's the one holding the planet together right now. You know, the stars and me and you and the birds and the animals, the trees. You know, because once Yahweh gets up off his mercy seat, you realize every single atom in this universe is just going to rip. And it's going to, look, when, if, if you study a little bit of nuclear science, okay, when an atom is, is ripped apart, it explodes. And it creates a huge fire, right? It's not a little bit, it's a lot. And that's what happened in like the hydrogen bombs. And um, what are some other ones? You know, nuclear bombs and stuff like that. So that's just a, a physical example, okay? I know none of, none of us here can truly comprehend how big of a magnitude scale Yahweh's universal revelation will be, but we're talking about, well, Disintegration, disintegration of everything. That's why it's important to know Yahshua now, you know, and you got to read there. Um, you know, you got to know how you got to know who the Savior is. That's the way I could say it. You have to know who the true Savior is. And a lot of people are not going to want to hear this, and I don't care. It's not Jesus. It's not Allah. It's not Buddha. It's not uh, Lord, God. Um, you know, the Easter Bunny, the Tooth Fairy, Santa Claus, all that junk. And I'm calling it junk because it is junk. It's spiritual pollution and it's spiritual poison, right? Because it's not the truth. It's Yahweh, when Yahweh made Satan, he, he gave him one job to do. Lie his entire existence. He was made that way. If you want to call anyone evil, it's him. He's evil. And his demons. And, and those souls he's captured. That will be lost at the end of the age. But there's also Yahshua, you know, the sons, the children of the light, the good. It's wonderful. You know, Yahweh's purpose isn't something happenstance. Like so many people think that things are random. Like they have no, no pattern to them. And, you know, it's, it shows the deep level of darkness in this world. And um, that's why Yahweh's in giving us this probationary period. You know, we're, on, we're all on borrowed time right now. That means any day now, this whole thing could just go poof. And that's that you're either in the lake of fire or you're in eternity with Yahweh and his angels. I mean... I know a lot of people don't understand the urgency of this. You know, I, I used to I used to be one of those. You know, I studied, but I never really studied study. I never got it. You know, I wasn't wasn't ready for it. You know, Yashua came on to me when I wasn't ready. You know, taught me slowly, but well, I can't say slowly because I know some people have been in here for 40, 50 years. And I've only been in here for, for 20 and Yahweh's taught me so much in so little time. But it just goes to show that hmm, Yahweh is real. You can't escape it. Nobody can escape it. The fact that Yahweh is real and he's going to have universal judgment here at any moment. Well, He's already judging everybody now. He's been judging everyone, you know, since he raised up Yahshua the Messiah from the dead since Pentecost. But I'll save that for another speaker because that's a lot to go into. And if I had four more hours, maybe 
no, I need four more hours. It, there's a, my point is this, there's a lot to cover on this. You're not going to get it in two hours. I didn't get it in two hours. Joel didn't get it in two hours. I'm pretty sure Tara didn't get it in two hours. The point is nobody did. There was, there was one guy. Okay. There was one guy, only one who got it in two hours. And when he, when he got home that day, after getting on one class, he died. And he was, I know exactly he was taken to eternity because there hasn't been a lot of that, you know, someone in this school listening to one class and then going home. But it just goes to show that time isn't of importance in this school. It's really about your connection with your creator, because in the end, that's the only thing that's going to save you. I can't save anyone. Pretty sure. Joel, can you save anyone? Joel can't save anybody. The point is this. To all the people out there who hear me on YouTube, Yash was your savior and he's your only savior. And he's the only one that's going to be your friend if, if you let him love you. And... Um, yeah, she was telling me that that was it. So I'll yield up the the baton, as we say, back to the moderator, and all praise goes to Yashua. And... Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our next speaker would be Dr. Sarah Thomas. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. Whew. I wanted to address one thing that the previous speaker said just briefly, and then I wanted to jump back into the scripture reading and focus on the tabernacle, which was mentioned. Um, Connor mentioned that, you know, something about everybody wants to have offspring, right? And then he said, well, I mean, not everybody wants to have offspring, but everybody wants to have offspring, you know, and I just kind of wanted to verify that, that even if a person doesn't want to have children from a physical standpoint, they want to have some kind of a legacy. They want to be fruitful in their life in some manner, right? So his statement of everybody, you know, wants to have offspring does bode accurate. You know, people want, they want something out there they want their name to be continued on somehow. If it's not through their children um, having their same name, it might be through the deeds that they do, the acts that they do, things they create, something they write, whatever, something they create. And just because it's not a like a child or something like that, I mean, people don't, just don't escape that nature of wanting to, to have their legacy carried on. So I, I just would have to agree with what he said that, you know, people want their name continued in some way, right? It could be just like, there's a lot of examples. But um, by the scripture reading and by some of the comments of the previous speaker, it sounds to me like um, it might be a, a wise thing to do to go into this, um, this tabernacle that was mentioned in the scripture and also in the moderation. So could you go back and get the part of Psalms 19 that talks about the heavens declare the glory of Elohim and just kind of read at that part. Is that right in the beginning? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <that's it. Okay. laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Psalms 19 and one, the heavens declare the glory of Yahweh or of Elohim and the firmament showeth his handiwork day unto day utter a speech and night unto night showeth knowledge okay so right there that's that's something notable that that we learn when we first come into class and the notable thing here is that there is knowledge to be had from the things that the creator made day on today utter speech i mean obviously you're not outside and you're not listening like it's not like we're hearing the like voices or something like that but in, in still, there's a message kind of being delivered by the things that were created in the world, like the things that were made day on today and night on tonight, it says, shows knowledge. And then read the next verse. 
There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. And it doesn't matter what language we speak. It doesn't matter if you even speak like a verbal language. You could be like a nonverbal person. You could be speaking with American Sign Language. You, it doesn't matter. There's no speech or language where this voice, this knowledge is not heard. Okay. Okay. Keep reading. Yes, please. Their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. So whatever this knowledge is, this knowledge that's going on, on day on today and night on tonight, and there's some kind of knowledge here and there's no speech that, it, that uh, where it cannot be heard in or whatever. Um, and it's, you know, it goes out as a line and then go ahead. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Okay, so right there, that's weird. Uh, if I was going to put myself, you know, years ago when I, before I came into class, I never heard the word tabernacle. Never, never. And some people will say, oh yeah, I heard tabernacle because I was Catholic and the thing in the front of the church where they held the host, it had a red light in it. That thing was called tabernacle. I didn't know that. Or they'll say, no, 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 there's a choir, the tabernacle choir, the Mormon tabern. No, I didn't hear about that either. The word tabernacle to me before I came into class would have been like a word that they didn't translate in the Bible. And I would have just been like, all right, whatever. I don't know what that is. Except for the fact that before this in Psalms, look at how important this might be, right? The day on today is knowledge and all there's a speech. And then all of a sudden in them, he said a tabernacle. And this, this word comes up at a point where it seems like it would be very important to know what this thing is. But you'll see right here on the chart, even staring at you in the face, right at the top, it says, it says, um, oh gosh, I have to make my, I have to maximize my window because I'm old enough not to see this. All right. So right at the top here, it talks about how um, it says Elohim, the archetype or original pattern of the universe. Do you see that? And right below that, it says creation by the pattern. And then, you know, so all of a sudden, you know, I'm seeing there's a tabernacle day on today under speech. And what I'm going to tell you here is the tabernacle is a pattern. And I'm going to, I'm going to prove that with the book. This is a pattern, a pattern or something that was written about in the Bible. And the purpose of it is to show knowledge, to show knowledge. Then it's throughout everything. Think back to what the moderator said right think back they said a whole bunch of stuff and then they said also in this school so they had a transition there we teach by the divine pattern of the universe it's called the divine pattern because it's yahweh our creator's pattern that's what the person in the moderation said and then they said in this school we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and nothing escapes the pattern and I'm just saying that from memory because this is something so profound um, from before, you know, when I, a pattern in the Bible, some kind of a pattern that speaks on to me day on today and night on tonight. It doesn't matter what language or, or voice it's in. Like, I need to know more about this. I want to know more about this because to be honest, before I was in class and stuff, I was not really a Bible person. I wasn't even sure if I was a, I believe in God person, but if there's a pattern that goes through the entire creation and that I can find it in the Bible and that somehow everything can go according to this pattern, that, that is some kind of a proof that there's more to this than just some kind of an accidental uh, scenario that created everything. You know, like Connor had mentioned that things are created deliberately and for a reason. So let's grab a few things. Um, if you looked it up, and you don't have to right now, if you looked up the word tabernacle because you hadn't heard it before, you would find it means like tent or like a, a temporary shelter or something like that. And it would also refer to this picture here. It would say that it was a, a sanctuary used by the Israelites during the Exodus. That's what you would find in the dictionary. You could look it up online. You could look it up in a paper dictionary. However, there's more to it than this because like we said in the moderation, it's maybe there's, there's this a pattern. This is a bigger thing than what it looks like. Not just a little temporary tent, but there might be more to it than that. Let's jump back. Why don't we get where this pattern was even revealed? We'll just start with that. Exodus 25 and eight and nine. 
And so we're just going to jump through the book. We're going to look a little bit in the Bible because the first time I heard anything about this class, it was on a bus, uh, 18 hour bus ride from Wisconsin to Colorado. And I was in high school and a person uh, that I didn't really know well, um, sat down with a napkin and drew a picture of this tabernacle on a napkin and talked to me about how this napkin picture could be seen throughout the creation of the world, including things like the, the human body and geography and time and history. And I did not know that this thing was written about in the Bible. I just thought this was some weird thing that this kid's religion kind of came up with and he drew it on a napkin and I was like, it's really cool. But only afterwards, when I was in the hotel room, and of course, they have free Bibles, you know, in the hotel rooms, there the tabernacle is written about in a Bible. And I was like, oh my goodness, this isn't just something some people came up with. This was written about in biblical history, you know, and that was shocking to me. So I want to show you that this is in the Bible, first of all. And secondly, then I kind of want to show you how it works. So Exodus 25, 8 and 9. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. Okay, so do you remember when Connor was explaining how the children of Israel were, were saved from bondage in Egypt? They came to the wilderness. They followed, you know, a cloud out and they made it out of, out of Egypt. So here they are. They're going to worship Yahweh at the mount. Moses is called up to the top of the mount and he's given a vision. And that's what it says here on this chart. Look, panoramic vision of Elohim to Moses. And you'll see, if you look at just the way that this is drawn, you see, oh, I see Yahweh Elohim Yahshua on that figure of a man. And right next to it, I see this letter B looks like a tabernacle. That's the exterior of the tabernacle. If you look all the way to letter E along that line, that's the interior of the tabernacle. So we're just trying, we try to illustrate things. So this is an illustration of what's happening here. And um, I am in Exodus 25 and 8 and 9. Um, and I bet, I feel like that's written somewhere here. But if you look just before it, you can see Exodus 24. And it shows all these people coming up the mount and having a vision. And then Moses goes up by himself. And then he's told this. It says, um, and see, um, he basically says, See that you make this thing the way that I showed you according to the pattern of the tabernacle. So right there, I'm connecting the word tabernacle. I'm connecting the word pattern. I'm showing you what was given to this guy in a vision. He, he was revealed this and he was told you have to make it exactly so, just so. Could you also just quick jump to Hebrews 8 and 5? We'll come back to this, but I just wanted to show like this is really important that he does it exactly right. Hebrews 8 and 5, make sure I'm unmuted, okay, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of Yahweh when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. It's just telling again the, the same thing. It's just saying, hey, Look, when Moses was in the mount and when Moses was given this vision, make see that you make all things according to this pattern. It's just a repeat, but look at the word here. Moses was admonished. He was warned. Like, hey, this is going to be important. This may just seem like a tent, a temporary sanctuary in the wilderness of Sinai that the children of Israel are going to haul around with them. It may seem like that to the outside, but it's not. It's, it's more than that. It's an example of heavenly things. It's an example of something bigger. Kind of like we said, if it's a pattern of all the things and Moses doesn't follow the pattern when he makes it, it's not going to be a good witness. It's not going to be a clear witness. It had to be made it had to be very deliberately put together according to a vision, according to exactly what Yahweh said. Is that the whole thing in Hebrews? Uh, yep. Okay, so let's jump back to Exodus 25 and 8 and 9. We'll do this again. Exodus 25 and 8. And, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them 
according to all that I showed thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. Got to make it exactly how I showed it, according to the pattern. And then if we drop down. The 40. Yep. And look that thou make the, I'm sorry, and look that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. Yeah, he repeated it and he repeated it. And I feel like this look felt a lot like the type of look I say to my kids when I want them to mm -hmm. do something just so look that you make it a certain way. Um, Yahweh didn't just show this one guy though. He actually, he put, he put his spirit inside of people to have them create this tabernacle exactly. So could we grab that where it has um, Aholiab and Bezalel? Gosh, where is that? Exodus so 31. One through three. Thank you. So this is going to show like not only did Yahweh admonish or warn Moses, not only did he show him in a vision and repeat it, you know, to show like, look, it's really important. He also, when he was having it constructed in the wilderness, he made sure it was going to be done just so. So go ahead and read that. Exodus 31 and one. And Yahweh spake unto Moses saying, see, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of Elohim in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. Okay, I filled this guy with the spirit of Yahweh and understanding, knowledge, workmanship. Okay. Is there more? Okay. I'm yeah. Not oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To devise cunning works to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones to set them and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. And I behold, I have given him, given with him a Holiab, the son of Ahizamach of the tribe of Dan. And then the hearts of all that are wise hearted, I have put wisdom that they may make all that I've commanded thee, the tabernacle of the congregation, the ark of the testimony and the mercy seat, that is thereupon and all the furniture of the tabernacle. It, it kind of goes on from there, yeah, um, it describing. Made, so it had to be made according to such specific specifications with such delicate workmanship so that it exactly followed the pattern. So that looking back um, on these things, these things were written for our learning. This could be a great witness to see, first of all, Yahweh exists and is real. He is wisdom itself. You know, he is knowledge itself. He is understanding itself. You can see these attributes at work here. And that if there could be a pattern written about in the Bible long before we had understanding of things like, um, like the anatomy and physiology of the body, like the modern understanding of anatomy and physiology, the modern discovery of America and, and the history of, of these things. If we had some kind of a pattern that would somehow show that, that was written about long ago, long before, like how long ago was this? Look, panoramic vision of Elohim to Moses, 1490 before the birth of Yahshua. That's a long time ago. It's a really long time ago, you know, and yet these things that were written about back there, we can see uh, in, the, in, the, in the creation, in the universe, and they're giving knowledge. They're, they're showing the truth of you know Yahweh's attributes and they're showing that Yahweh's real and he creates things according to this pattern. Let's jump and just grab one thing, I guess. The rest I'll just randomly quote and then we'll show how this works. So first of all, look at this chart. You see there's the tabernacle in the middle there. It says it's in the wilderness of Sinai. So the children of Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness of Sinai and they, the whole time that they were down here, they were um, they were following a cloud. They were following Yahweh around who appeared as a pillar of cloud. And they would pick up the parts of this tabernacle and they would move it around the wilderness in, in order whenever the cloud moved. This was kind of what they did um, for, for quite some time. And then eventually they were able to take these things from the tabernacle. They were able to cross over the River Jordan. You can kind of see a picture of it um, on the top and the kind of like, I guess a little above the midpoint of this chart. And you can see there's people walking through and you can see that um, 
the mercy seat and the Ark of the Covenant. You can see that is part of the tabernacle and it's kind of going through. And then up here we can see in the part that's labeled Canaan's land or the promised land, we can see that there's something called the temple up there. So the pattern that we see in the wilderness, this tabernacle pattern would be very much like if a a person was lying down and you're going to see that shortly with the anatomy and how it fits this but up in the temple those vessels and and were were you could find these same principles this same pattern up here in the temple except for it would be more like a man seated like on a on a throne or on a seat okay so whatever tabernacle pattern we see the pattern here we can see the pattern in the temple so now let's get um first chronicles 28 and 19 because when yahweh revealed the same pattern um to david he does it a certain way and this is where um it's kind of a witness that says hey here you can do this too you could understand this too all right so let's get that in first chronicles First Chronicles 28 and 19, all this said David, Yahweh made me understand in writing by his hand upon me, even all the works of this pattern. Yahweh made him understand the works of this pattern. He made David understand the works of this pattern by his hand right upon him. You know, Yahweh caused him to be able to understand that. So we see the idea that there's a pattern um, we can see it was revealed. It had to be a certain way. So I'm just going to go through and I'm going to show you how this pattern correlates right over to your, the anatomy of your body. And the purpose of doing that is to say, hey, first of all, um, everything's created according to this pattern, including you. Um, also, if you, it, how many times did I say the pattern had to be created? This tabernacle had to be created with such careful specifications. And if you think about the way that our body is, you know, there are certain things, if it goes wrong in our body, that's the end of that. Lights out. Like, I know that the body can take some trauma. We understand that. We know that people have been in accidents. We know there's some serious surgeries people can go through, but there are certain things about it that had to be made exactly according to specifications, or that body is not going to function for life, right? So, this is the chart that we like to use for this because it's a nice illustration. Most people have an understanding at least to a point of how their body's put together. I'm not gonna be talking about this like I'm a doctor. I'm not a doctor, I just have a body. And also this has been revealed, you know, so there's that. But if we take a look here, you'll notice on the left side, here's the tabernacle pattern. It shows the different vessels in there. There's nine vessels. It shows some things. There's a couple of layers of linen that went on the outside of it. There were three parts to the tabernacle. Um, there was a court roundabout, a holy place, and a most holy place. If you were to look at the tabernacle, like from an above sort of view, you would see these vessels in the court roundabout. That was open, like a yard. But the holy place and most holy place were covered over. They were hidden away kind of covered over by skins and things. So um, that's kind of how that was. It was three three parts, three compartments, but it was one tabernacle, okay? Um, similarly, we have on the other side, you can see these are the human body broken into um, organs and systems, just so I can show you there's, there's a comparison between these things. So the way the tabernacle worked, Yahweh had them build the tabernacle. He gave them a vision how to do it. And it took them 40 weeks 40 weeks to construct the tabernacle, okay, um, until it was dedicated. Similarly, when you are conceived, it takes your body 40 weeks until you are dedicated to this world, right? You, you're birthed. It's a 40-week process, nine months. So if we look back at the tabernacle, the children of Israel had a law that they had to follow. And as part of that law, if they transgress the law, the penalty was death. However, everybody would have died and Yahweh wouldn't have had that legacy to say, look, I saved these people um, from Egypt because they all would have died in the wilderness because of their sin, because they broke the law. So Yahweh, knowing that they could not do these things, they didn't have the heart in them. He, he set up this tabernacle, this I'm talking about this physical tabernacle as a way out, as a, as a vessel of salvation to them. So if they transgress the law, they could bring a sacrifice to the tabernacle. And that, that sacrifice, it could be an animal, 
could be would be killed it would be cut up um it would be washed and they would burn it you know so the, as part of the atonement for their sin as like uh like the animal could die in the place of the person you know if that if that kind of makes sense so they are sacrificing all the time people have a nature in them to sin so if we look here, court roundabout, you've got a laver of water. This was like a huge bird bath made of brass. And there was a spigot system where they could empty out the water. If you can imagine parts of animals getting dunked in this thing, you'd have water that would look relatively yellow before you washed animal parts in it because the brass from the, the, the laver would reflect up. But when you put water, you can see the picture. See this blood? It was like a bloody water. So this is where they would wash the sacrifice pieces. You'll notice down below it, it says there's a kind of like a, like a square, um, almost looks like a barbecue grill or something. This would be the altar of sacrifice. It had a grating system. It was also made of brass. They kindled this fire and then the sacrifice would be burnt. The ashes from that sacrifice would fall through the grating system. And then they had, um, they would scoop the, the ashes out and dispose of them. You also notice in this core roundabout, you see there's a person there that would be a priest and it looks as if there's, in the picture, it looks like a tea uh, pot or something dripping something on his head. That's the, the horn of holy anointing oil. This was a, a specially prepared oil. They would pour it over the priest. This would signify that they were going to operate flawlessly they were going to do things according to the spirit of Yahweh so that is the court roundabout all right so if there is new folks down here we don't sacrifice animals down here this is not a thing that we do you know this is something from the past that we learn that we learn about but these principles these ideas behind this they can be seen in everywhere including your physical body. So if we look over here at the court roundabout of the body, that would be called our abdominal cavity, you know, like your gut, your stomach, right? So if we take a look, I talked about the laver first, so I'll talk about what would be similar to the laver over here. So you can see um, kind of uh, a round and configuration organ here. It's actually two organs. If you notice, they're kind of pushed together. Those are your kidneys. Your kidney's job is to cleanse your blood. So, and we know that if we have friends or family who have to go through dialysis, it's because their kidneys aren't cleaning their blood anymore. And those dialysis machines pull the blood out of them, to clean them and put them, you need, you need your blood cleansed from impurities and things. Kidneys are very important. But just like we have in the court roundabout, a laver that was made for cleansing the sacrifice, here, here you have, these kidneys, which are made for cleansing, right? They're made for cleansing. Just like the lavers round in configuration, you can see these two kidney-shaped kidneys, and this is why it's called kidney shape, are together and that makes a round configuration. You can see that there's a, a principle of this bloody water, right? And that's what the kidneys are cleansing. They're cleansing your blood. And whatever impurities the kidneys take out, you'll see that it drains down here into your bladder. And just like there is a way for your kidneys to get rid of those waste products through the bladder as urine, similarly, you have the, um, the spigot system that they could use to empty out that labor. I mean, I'm not kidding when I say it was huge. It was way bigger than a bird bath somebody would have in their yard. There's no way they're gonna eat that thing over to dump the water out. So, and, and your urine, healthy urine is a nice yellow, golden color, similar like before this, um, this blood would get in there, you would have kind of like that reflection of that, um, like a, a golden looking water. Sometimes these animals that they would sacrifice would have um, bits of stones and things. And we know that people get kidney stones, right? You know, so it's very similar um, in the idea behind these things. So here that sacrifice that those sacrifice parts were buried into that water you know similar that blood is kind of goes through those kidneys as like like a burial to you know clean them out before they resurrect back out if we look um down at the altar of sacrifice you can see that this correlates over to if you can recognize this this is your small intestine in the middle and your large intestine on the outside 
you can see there's a whole bunch of blood. Um, so just like this altar of sacrifice was four sides, similar this your large intestine, which goes all around here, is four parts. Uh, it's four sides. Um, your ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colon. And I know that's not a word I would have, those words I wouldn't have had in my vocabulary before coming into class. But I will say that there's one, two, three, four separate sides, just like that square altar has four separate sides. You notice in here there's blood that's feeding that colon, those colic arteries that's feeding it. There were four horns on that altar and there were blood placed on those horns. Just like that, four points of blood around that, that large intestine. And in the middle, that's your small intestine. It's all mashed in there. And in high school biology, we had to dissect a fetal pig. And there was extra credit given to the student who could unravel without breaking the small intestine of this tiny baby pig. Really hard, really hard to do. You would not believe the length, you know, 22 some feet in a human of, of small intestine. And it's all mashed in there, just slopped in. Um, and it, it does give that appearance of a grading system. Just like, the sheep or whatever had to die in order for these people to live um, with the tabernacle, the, the food that you eat was alive <laughs> and it had to die in order for you to live, whether it was an animal or a vegetable, it was taken from its life source and it's, it's sacrificed so that you can, you can live. And your intestines is where that food absorption takes place and whatever's left after your body takes that nutrients out of that food and takes that liquid out of there is your waste product and that's passed out through your colon. Just like they got rid of the ashes, you have a way to get rid of the waste product in your body too. You know, so it's, it's, it's so similar. And then finally, in this core roundabout, you'll notice I mentioned that thing that looked like a teapot, that horn of holy anointing oil. Well, this, you can see, there's not like a separate vessel. It doesn't look like a se separate organ on this chart, but look above the kidneys. It looks like each of those kidneys have kind of like a, like a growth or something on the top. That's not a growth. Those are, um, those are the adrenal glands. So that's where humans have their adrenal glands. And those are the glands that if you've ever been in a situation, um, most recently for me, like I live in Wisconsin, it's very um, snowy and icy. And I don't like to drive in the bad weather anymore. Um, now that I've driven in enough bad weather, I guess I made it to my quota. But if I'm driving and I go around a curve and I notice suddenly there's a patch of ice, and then I get through the curve just fine. It doesn't even matter if I made it through fine. My entire body feels like I have just drank three espressos. I'm like, I have a huge quickening. Like I am more alert. I am faster. I am more aware because my, my body's like, you need adrenaline? Here you go. It pours in this fight or flight hormone into me so that I can perform flawlessly in an emergency. Similarly, that um, oil that was poured over the priest was supposed to have him perform flawlessly. What kind of life or death situation is a guy going to go through who's dunking animal parts in a laver and burning them on an altar? If they did anything that wasn't according to this pattern, the, the penalty was death for these priests. You know, if they did anything that wasn't according to what Yahweh set up, there were even some guys who tried to offer incense that wasn't according to what Yahweh wanted. And they were, they were, they were put to death. They died. So there was a life or death situation to these folks. They had to act safe, uh, safely within the parameters of what Yahweh set up. So I know that that always just felt like a lot, but this is how the tabernacle could be a pattern for things in the universe. If you think back to any knowledge you might have had in your past, you know, let us make man in our likeness and our image. You know, it's right in Acts. Uh, Genesis in the book, like how could people, how could all people be made according to the image of God? I mean, honestly, like I'm a relatively thick 40 year old woman. I got an eight year old kid who's as skinny as a, as a pole. My son is 
seems like he's two feet taller than me. You know, like, how can we all be made in the same likeness and image? My skin color is so much different from my niece and my nephew's skin color. How can we be made in the same likeness and image? But it's because of this pattern. You know, this is the pattern of everything. This is the pattern of Elohim. You know, this is the pattern we're made according to. So now a little bit more quickly, let's go through the holy place. Um, and the purpose of going a little bit more quickly is because I feel like time is slipping. But anyway, so in the holy place, this is the next part of the tabernacle. You notice that also there are three vessels in there. You'll see that there looks like what we would consider to be like a menorah. This is a seven branch lab stand. It looks like a little table with cakes on it. That is the table of shoe bread. And then it looks like there's kind of like, um, almost like a cabinet or something with smoke coming out of the top. This is an illustration of the altar of incense. So here is the holy place. And unlike the court roundabout, this part of the tabernacle is covered over. Even though you can see into it in this picture, I mean, it, this is just for us to be able to point out the vessels, but it is covered over in the when they built it in the wilderness. Um, just like if somebody would sock you in the stomach, you know, hopefully not, there's nothing protecting your your stomach you're, you're gonna it's gonna throw the air right out of you it hurts really bad you're gonna feel like you're gonna throw up you know your stomach has no bones covering over the top of it but when you get up to here to this part this holy place which would be just like your um thoracic or chest cavity all of a sudden you can feel you got ribs covering that over you have um, a sternum covering that over. So all now we're covered. We're covered over with bones. Okay. So um, holy place. All these vessels are made of um, gold, and um, the the lampstand had to be lit at certain times because they could never have darkness in the holy place. There was a certain number of loaves of bread on that um, that table of shoe bread it had two golden crowns running around it i'm just kind of going through the details of these things now this is where the priests ate there were also like cups and spoons and things on there and then that altar of incense the incense was made according to yahweh's um secret recipe i guess i could say it was given to somebody they he was revealed just like a holy and bezalel were given the spirit of yahweh this was revealed in a vision to somebody it was made after what was called the art of the apothecary and that incense had four main ingredients so um you'll also see it says first veil so if you look at the body in between where it says tabernacle of man you can kind of see all the intestines and stuff. You see the stomach, you see the liver. And right above that, you see like a bluish line below the lungs and heart. This is your, this is um, your diaphragm, okay? Just like there was a separation between the court roundabout and the holy place in the tabernacle, you have a separation between your, your stomach area and your chest area. And that's this big sheet of mus muscle called your diaphragm. A diaphragm is when it pulls down, it allows your lungs to take in air. And when it pushes up, it pushes the air out of your lungs. It's your, it's the big sheet of muscle that helps you breathe. Similar to the fact that there was this blue, purple, and scarlet veil between these two places in the tabernacle, that diaphragm would be considered like a blue, purple, and scarlet veil uh, because there are, um, veins and arteries and capillaries that are feeding that big sheet of muscle just like there was a door between the holy place and the court roundabout there's a portal it's it's actually called that you could look it up in between that diaphragm where the portal vein and all these vessels go down through um and here, so there's a door and um this door it's not like it was a wooden door something that would close it was more like a doorway and you would have that breeze from you know just the elements outside and it would kind of move that veil much like your diaphragm is moved by the wind that you're breathing in so it's pretty easy probably to see just in this picture of the holy place what uh these different um tabernacle vessels could be like because you can see there's a heart, there's some lungs that you would recognize, and then it looks like some big blood vessels. And it's just gonna be just like that. So I'll talk about the part that correlates with the lampstand first. 
you notice that there is this red aortic arch that comes off at the top of the heart. There are seven branches that come off of that thing. Seven branches that come off of that thing. It's just like there were seven branches that come off of that lamb stand. Three of the branches are paired. Three of the blood vessels that come off of that are paired. One stood alone. Similarly, one stands alone. So that, that's right in your aortic arch. And the inside of that aorta and any blood vessel is called a lumen. The tube, the inside tube, the open space, a lumen. Lumen means light. And you know you got to have light continually inside this holy place. Like I mentioned, your heart has got to send blood through that, that vessel continually, or you will, you will not be alive anymore, you know. So um, that aortic arch is just like that, that um, lamp stand, that seven branch lamp stand. You also see there's a heart here. This is going to correlate over to that table that I mentioned, the table of shoe bread. Um, the priest would eat, eat off of there. Um, and especially Cheerios commercials, also like Quaker Oats commercials, it talks about um, you got to eat heart smart. You got to eat heart smart. Why don't you eat stomach smart? Your stomach is where you're, you know, but whatever. You've got to eat heart smart because once you're, um, in, you know, your blood vessels take away the nutrients and everything from your food. I mean, everything passes through your heart, everything, you know, so we eat from our heart because it goes up to the heart and then it's passed through all, from, from there to our whole body in order to, you know, feed us, I guess, feed the cells of our body. Um, so just like they ate off of there, um, we eat off of our heart. You'll notice there's four sides to that table. One, two, three, four. You've got four uh, chambers in your heart, two atria, two ventricles. They're like um, different valves and things inside your heart. There's like cusps, just like there's little cups and spoons on that, um, that table shoe bread. Um, two, two golden crowns come around that table of shoe bread. And it's just so you have, and this sounds weird, two of those arteries that come off of that aortic arch, the two pair, one of those pairs is the um, coronary arteries, which wrap around your heart. They're encased in kind of a, a golden fatty tissue. And those two um, arteries feed your heart. So you have two gold crowns. I say crowns because coronary, coronation, unicorn, I guess. <laughs> no, not unicorn. <laughs> Corona, stupid coronavirus. Corona is a crown. So you have two gold crowns running around your heart. You know, so just like that table, there were 12 pints of blood that go through your body on average, right? I guess 160 pound person. I, I suppose the average man is a different size nowadays since the, you know, the 70s when this data with the 12 pints of blood was published, but there were 12 loaves of bread on there on that table. So very similar. I have never heard it called the tables of your heart, but people who are maybe two generations above me in school called these the four tables or the tables of your heart. So uh, it's very similar that some of these medical terminology matches this pattern. And finally, there's that altar of incense with the four ingredients. This was the sweet smelling savor to Yahweh. There were four horns on that thing, just like there were four horns over on the the altar of sacrifice, this correlates to your lungs. You'll notice that the lungs, um, this, uh, this is where you take in your breath. You breathe in. Um, it's a sweet smelling savor. I always think of when I was a little kid and I'd get freaked out in my bed and I'd cover up under the blankets. And then eventually I'd get brave and I'd take the blanket off of my head and how much of a sweet smelling savor that cool bedroom air was, you know? So like your air that we breathe, it's a sweet smelling savor to us, just like it was a sweet smelling savor to Yahweh. Um, and there are four main ingredients to the air we breathe. And an especially witness, good witness for this is that there were four main ingredients to Yahweh's name, four main letters in the Tetragrammaton, the Y, H, W, H, or in Hebrew, the Yud, He, Wav, He, and that is the four ingredients we breathe. We breathe in and we breathe out 
and we do this right in this, right in our lungs, a sweet smelling savor to Yahweh, Yahweh who says his name is forever and he loves his name. Um, coincidentally, <laughs> Uh, and by coincidentally, I mean to coincide exactly according to this pattern, um, that those lungs, they're your bronchial tree here. Do you see those lungs? They're like on an upside down tree. That's Yahweh's name being breathed in a bush that is burning and not being consumed. Okay, so the bronchial tree is like a bush. When I say it's burning and not being consumed, I mean there's like that oxygen um, and that oxygen ex exchange right within that, your, your lung system. And you don't have to jump over there, but if we think about that other chart, you know, Egypt might be like the court roundabout and the wilderness of Sinai would be like this holy place. And the wilderness of Sinai was where Yahweh revealed his name to Moses in a burning bush. So this is the pattern for everything. It's for, it's for everything. And so that kind of can correlate that way across geography as well, biblical history and things. So then we come to a next veil. This veil would separate the holy place from the most holy place. It was also blue, purple, and scarlet, much like the other veil. And this would be just like um, where we would have a separation between our thoracic cavity or our chest cavity and our head cavity or cranial cavity. Um, unlike the diaphragm, which was a big, thick sheet of, or big sheet of muscle that separated the other two parts of our body, now you got, um, I mean, I can hold up my head, but it's not like I got a big sheet of muscle in my neck, okay? So you can see this maybe a little bit better here um, on this image, but you can see blue going up and, or well, I guess going down is the jugular veins. And you see the red going up and these are the carotid arteries. And then you see this weird purple looking, almost like a, on its side an hourglass or something. And this I'm just showing in the tabernacle of man in the center. This is your thyroid gland. Um, and your thyroid gland um, stores iodine. Iodine means purple or violet, right? So you've got red or scarlet, you got blue, and then you got that purple, that blue, purple, and scarlet separation and veil from the holy place into the most holy place. Up in the most holy place, you can see there is um, the high priest is wearing garments of beauty and glory. He's carrying incense. He only was able to go up there once a year on the day of atonement. And up in there, um, it was darkness. There was a mercy seat. There was this Ark of the Covenant. And there were these two angel figurines where they're um, facing each other their wings kind of arced up, but they didn't meet in the center. When the priest would go up there once a year, that incense would form a cloud inside between those two angels. And then Yahweh would appear with, was like with a, a, in between those archangels to signify um, that the children of Israel had atonement or were one with him for another year. He forgave them of their sins. This is very similar to what's going on in your head cavity. And this is your, you know, correlates uh, over to several parts of your, of your brain. So you've got the, the cloud that appears between the, the wings of the archangels. That's like a, uh, you, you can picture an incense cloud. It's going to be made of kind of a white or a grayish smoke. Um, that would be like this tissue that's inside of your, this is your brain tissue this gray and white, gray and white matter. And it's all convoluted, similar to a cloud. You know, there's all these ridges and things. You've got two hemispheres of your brain here and they come up together, just like those wings of the, the archangels, but in the center, they don't meet. I mean, um, they're, not, they're, they're, they're not melded together. You don't have just one big um, hunk of brain. You've got the right and left hemispheres are separate from each other. There's this great fissure in the middle. And then the thing that the, the two halves of that brain, the two hemispheres sit, sit on, that's a big bundle of nerves. And I've heard it pronounced the corpus callosum, and I've heard it pronounced the corpus callosum, but it is a body of nerves that holds that down, like just like that mercy seat. And inside that Ark of the Covenant, there were, there were several things. One of the things in there is the Ten Commandment Law on tables of stone. And this 
right in, in your head, right in your head. And it shows the word law on this person's mouth. The reason that's written there is because it's trying to show us about this, this pituitary gland that's right there. It would be like right above the roof of your mouth, kind of if you, if you imagine a 3D head. And this, law, this is the, the master gland of the body. This is the law that tells you things like when to grow and when to um, go, go into puberty. There's 10 hormones that are associated with this, this pituitary gland. There were 10 laws written on the tables of stone. The table, the tables of stone were made of a uh, sort of stone, I guess we would say. And pituitary has that word pit right in it. That's that word stone is right hidden within that word. So um yeah, so like let me just randomly pause. There are other things going on in there. They had Aaron's rod that budded that was in there. Um, you know, and things, and some of this correlates, there are other things going on. Um, I've heard lectures where people have correlated that to the idea that, um, you know, you have, you know, in your eyes, you've got cones and you've got rods, you know, and they help you to, to see, you know, and there's a lot of really neat, you know, correlations back and forth, but it can go deep as you want or superficial as you want. The idea that we are made of three main body cavities and yet one person. And that's a witness for this tabernacle. Yeah, and I'll bring up the boards, pillars and bars and something else kind of cool. So um, now people will say, look, yeah, I got a head and I got a chest and I got an abdomen, but I've also got arms and legs. So what about that? My husband, Matt works with kids um, who have different various disabilities. And some of his students are missing those parts. Some are missing, physically missing arms and legs. Some are missing the complete function of arms and legs. You know, they're hemiplegics or they're quadriplegics. They do not need their arms and legs to survive. It makes it easier to move around, right? And to do certain things to function, but they're not a necessity for life. Just like, um, we have our arms and legs all camped around this tabernacle were the children of Israel. And the children of Israel, um, those 12 tribes, when that cloud, as I had mentioned, picked up and moved around, they had to pick up this tabernacle and they moved it around the wilderness and followed that cloud. Similar to the fact that when my brain tells my arms and legs that I'm going to move somewhere, my body follows the messages from my brain you know, and then also, so anyway, and then, you know, 12 tribes of Israel, people will correlate it like this. You got a hand, you got a lower arm, you got an upper arm, that's three. You got a foot, you got a lower leg, you got an upper leg, one, two, three, that's six. And then you got your other side, that's 12. So you got 12 tribes moving you around. You got 120 bones in your extremities. Once again, that principle of 12 moving you around. Something really cool about the tabernacle, before I bring up the bars, the pillars, and the boards, do you see there's two layers of linen around the outside of this tabernacle? So two layers of linen. So basically, if you could kind of picture, if you were making a blanket tent or something for your kid and you had like a broomstick and then you hung a sheet over the broomstick, and you had one layer hanging on one side and one layer hanging on the other side. Okay, if you could picture that, that's how we get our two layers of linen. And um, linen is a type of cloth. And that represents your skin because you have two main layers of your skin, your epidermis and your dermis. But something really cool that occurred to me pretty recently. Recently, I purchased two shirts um, online and they're linen shirts. And I forget this once in a while, but then I order these shirts and I've got them for four minutes or something. Linen is so wrinkly. Linen gets really wrinkly, really fast. Of any fabric that I own in my house, linen is the one that I'm kind of like, oh, why did I buy this? I don't iron. You know, I don't iron uh, if, if that, you know, so I don't iron. But linen is so wrinkly. And you know what else? Uh, our skin, 
<laughs> gets wrinkly. Our, our skin gets wrinkly. That's, that's how you can tell your age, you know? So I thought that that was a, maybe very silly on some level, but the fact that the layers of our skin, you know, this represents our skin. And here I've got these two shirts in my closet that I'm like, well, I can't wear these unless somebody's going to iron them for me because they're too wrinkly, you know, just like our skin, you know, ends up being wrinkly or something. You notice here on the chart, it says the, the bone structure of man represents the pillars, the bars, and the boards in the tabernacle, you know, and if you think about the pillars, the bars, and the boards, you have different types of bones in your body too, you know, you got your long bones, and you got your flat bones, you know, you got your cranial bones, everything different, but it's all, it's all, it's all a witness for that, you know, um, can I grab, can we get, um, the chart, the most, the migratory track chart. Just like that's a tabernacle pattern that fits your body. It's the pattern of everything. And I kind of alluded to this a little bit, but this isn't, this isn't just the pattern of our body period. You know, it's, it's this, it, it fits this, this migratory chat track that these folks went out of Egypt. You can see principles of the tabernacle right here, like down here in Egypt, you had, they had to um, sacrifice a lamb for the Passover lamb to be able to get out of Egypt. So you had a similar idea of that, that sacrifice, just like there was that altar of sacrifice. You had, um, you know, they had to come to the Red Sea and they had to get through the Red Sea, right? Um, you had the fact that Moses was following, you know, directions directly given to him from Yahweh. The idea that he was able to perform flawlessly, that spirit was with him, with him. You know, those ideas, just like the altar, the labor, and the horn of holy anointing oil, those things were, were repeated here in Egypt. Um, you know, in a lot of different ways, but that's just my really fast ways. Um, then in the wilderness of Sinai, Yahweh rained down manna, and they ground that up into kind of like a, like a coarse flour, and they padded it into bread cakes, like loaves. So just like there was this table of shoe bread here, they were given bread to eat in the wilderness, bread from heaven. And similar to the fact that there's this, um, this lampstand, there was light continually in the in the holy place. Yahweh by day was a pillar of cloud, so the sun would be the light, but by night he was a pillar of fire, so that they were not in the dark in the wilderness at all. Just like that lampstand had to be lit at certain times, so there was no darkness in the in the holy place. And I already mentioned the one about the name being given here at the altar of incense, the idea that at the burning bush, a bush that was being burnt but not consumed, and that's where Yahweh's name was revealed. Um, you can also look at it like, you know, Moses was an intercessor for those people, you know, he was. And then in the most holy place, you have the idea that, you know, you could go with this was their promised land, you know, Yahweh is our, you know, he says to Abraham, I'm your shield and your exceeding great reward, like I'm your promise, you know, but also, you know, that, that Ark of the Covenant went up and, you know, he, Yahweh, um, he had his temple created, like I said, with that same principle as like a man, you know, sitting on a throne or something. So anyway, if we can jump back to, because now I see I ended up taking the, like, the whole time on accident, but it's like a lot of information really fast. But anyway, you got a body, you ate supper, probably, I had pizza, it had to die in order for me to live, right? Even though pizza is not something that you would find like roaming around the fields, the sausage on that pizza had to die so I could live, the wheat that they made the flour out of, right? So, you know, so there's this principle, the tomatoes, the poor tomatoes, you know, they had to sacrifice their lives for me. And that food, you know, without that, thanks, I got five minutes. Without that food, I'd be dead. I'd be dead. Something else has to die so that I can live on a daily basis. And I eat that food, you know, and it goes into my, it goes through this process, right? And then later that food it resurrects as energy and as, you know, whatever various creative attempts that I make or, or whatever. So 
we see this, this is, this is how everything is created. And kind of cool, down in the bottom here with the current roundabout, because Connor mentioned this, look at this, there's a little pattern inside of the pattern. There's like a cycle. You have the altar here where something had to die in order for them to live. You had the laver where they had to bury the pieces of the sacrifice in it. So you had a death, then you had a burial. And then this horn of holy anointing oil represents like a resurrection or a quickening the spirit, right? Or you can go with blood with the altar, water with the labor and spirit with the oil so that the fact is as many classes as you've ever heard where somebody works with death burial resurrection look at that it's right in your pattern death with the altar burial with the labor and then resurrection with that horn of holy anointing oil and then once they went through this then they could later go up into the the holy place you know and that was like that ascension that that was earlier mentioned, or, you know, blood on the laver, the animal, you know, there's the blood, right? Because there was this animal was killed and love you too, good night. Then there was um, blood water, because there's water in the laver. I mean, I guess that one's not too hard. And then spirit, the oil represented spirit. And then after that, um, you could consider the door to be the fourth step, or you can consider the dimensions in the holy place, and you can get a principle of 40. So anyway, if you've ever heard anybody in this class talk about how there's a death, a burial, and a resurrection, and then a glorification, or they talk about how there's a blood, water, spirit, and then a 40 in the scriptures, that means that the scriptures or science or your day-to-day -day life or whatever it is, it goes right according to this pattern too that this cycle is right within that, you know, in everything that we do, you know, so that's also a pretty great gift. Let's jump back into Psalms and we'll just, we'll wrap it up here with just getting this one last time, Psalms 19. And this is back to the scripture reading, just the first like four or so verses. Psalms 19 and one, the heavens declare the glory of Yahweh or of Elohim in the Okay. I'm s sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. I think I'm in like a, like a weird version of the Bible accidentally. Oh, I'm so sorry. Do you have it, Tara? <laughs> yeah, I have it. Psalms 19 and 1. The heavens declare the glory of El, and the firmament show of his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night show of knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Okay, so going. we all have we all have this we all have these we all have the anatomy and physiology of our bodies that are working on a day to day basis, and everything about this is showing us Yahweh. Everything about this is showing us that Yahweh put His wisdom and knowledge into some guys long ago and taught them how to do these things and to make these things and follow this workmanship exactly as He showed them in a vision, and that Yahweh was able to take everything in the creation, everything in the universe, and was able to create it according to this, this tabernacle, you know? And if you just, I guess, look at this very top of this chart, it says it's man-made in the image of Elohim. Elohim is that pattern. Elohim is the pattern. And then we see the tabernacle as a physical example of what that pattern is. We can see those principles within it you know, right here operating so that man can be made in the, in, in the image of the creator. How? Because we're made according to this pattern that the scriptures can go according to a pattern. Why? Because everything is going according to that pattern, whether it's history, things that are invisible, things in the present, things in the past, you know, or anything to come and anything you're interested in, you know, you're going to be able to see these principles. It's just nice to know how the tabernacle worked, not because we're sitting here trying to sacrifice animals or recreate this old way of worship, but because this is an amazing tool that you can use to prove that things in the Bible, things in the creation, you know, things that we understand, that they are, uh, that they're trying to teach you something, that they're that knowledge that's going day to day and, you know, day unto day uttering knowledge or day unto day uttering speech, night unto night showing knowledge, you know, and that knowledge is about him. 
yeah, it's cool that I could maybe still do pretty good in like a high school level anatomy class because I have this knowledge, but that's not what the point is. The point is to, to his glory, right? It's to utter speech of these spiritual things. Um, thank you. Hallelujah, and thank you. It was a very edifying, very edifying class entirely. And we'd like to take a moment and thank everyone for attending this evening and remind you that classes are held here, uh, sorry, on Zoom every Wednesday from seven to nine and on Sundays from 11 to one. Um, at on Sheldon Road, and this Sunday class has been uh, canceled. This Sunday only, this January first, um, two thousand twenty-three. And with that, we can. No, um, Sherry, we decided to have class on Sunday. Okay, I didn't get that memo. I just sent you the text message when you asked me to. Oh, call. I didn't read. Okay. Okay, I'm glad you said that, okay. Okay, so class is held on Sunday from 11 to one at 6615 Sheldon Road in town and country. And we can all um, rise for the doxology to be dismissed, taken from the last two verses of Jude. Now unto him, that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let us all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Very enjoyable class. Very enjoyable. It was all crazy, guys.